Uh, hi, a very good evening to you and welcome to What Med Media. For those of you that are new here, I'm Dr. Kishan Reese. This is a channel that's been going for about five years uh, and I post updates when uh, the times are needing them, really. Uh, started out in a junior doctor's contract dispute, moved on towards NHS stuff, mothballed for a significant period of time uh, and then resurrected fairly spectacularly uh, over COVID. Unfortunately, obviously, I wish that we hadn't have needed to to resurrect it but we've certainly made a little bit of impact along the way um, in the sense that the, at our peak we've reached 1.2 million people and over the last 28 days we've reached uh, 400 odd thousand people um, so just while we're waiting good evening Max just while we're waiting for people to join um, if you could tell me how you are how you're doing what's it like where you are in the country I know we're entering potentially even more worrying times I don't know whether that's you thought that that was possible um, given the fact with the local lockdowns being implemented. I've got a few papers here that I wanted to talk through a few stories, um, answer any of your questions um, and just have a little little discussion really because I think um, we are making a difference and uh, we are having an impact as well collectively. So I thought it'd be worth just to sit down. Hey Pam, uh, I wonder if I can bring you on camera. I might try and do it later because otherwise I'll uh, lose my train of thought. So Pam, this is the, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 minute warning uh, I'm going to try and press that button to bring you on camera to see what happens after we get through um, the, the papers. Uh, so 14 people watching. If you can share it, if you can tag your friends, I would be really appreciative of it because the best organic reach we get, it basically means the less that I will spend on ads. Uh, that's your money that you're volunteering or you're kind of donating. Um, I'm spending it really, really carefully and we're getting it out to lots of people. So Mags, where is here? Everything back to normal. Um, I think it's it that sounds worrying, that sounds dangerous. Uh, certainly, um, hey Richard, you're right. Maybe if it'll bring you on camera as well, potentially. Uh, if you want to comment, let me know, Pam, let me know, Richard. I'd love to bring you on camera. I tried to test it the other morning when I was wandering and it didn't quite work. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, first thing I want to say is obviously listening to the headlines this evening on Sky and on BBC is a worrying time. Uh, I heard one kind of little report that was saying 9.2 odd million people are on furlough and a significant proportion of them don't know that they're basically going to be unemployed soon. Uh, so we are potentially reaching really, really worrying times. Um, and obviously the government are in a difficult position in terms of balancing the health risks and the economy risks and opening up the economy and the risk to health. To reassure you, for those of you that have been watching, some of you uh, who watch this may not have led left out at all um, the house um, because you don't want to go out and I completely understand that um, but just to reassure you and let you know certainly um, in Watford where I'm kind of going around the Harlequin or what it used to be called the Harlequin it's now into but it's probably going to change hands again given the fact that they're going to go into administration or if they haven't already hey Trisha you're right but what what um, to reassure you is that you know a one-way system has been put in more people are wearing masks um, hey Candy, how you doing? Um, oh no, East Kent Hospital is in the news for the most COVID deaths this week, lockdown number two. Wow. Uh, I mean, look, Anthony Fauci, whether you like him or loathe him in the US, was on last night and he was saying something along the lines of uh, we 100,000 cases could be the new norm a day. New cases in America, right? So and as you'll have seen, they've bought up the stock of a drug um, I can't remember what the name of the drug was, but they've literally just bought up the world supply um, Redes Redemesivir, I think. They've uh, bought it up, worldwide supply, so no other country can get hold of it for the next three months, right? So if we are going to be moving in towards that kind of situation, let's hope we don't, where we, we, we move towards a, moving towards a nationalist approach where people are just looking after their interests, right? What we need is a collaborative global approach where countries of the world and governments of the world and NGOs are working together because anywhere in the world, if uh, COVID or coronavirus is still uh, rife, then the whole global community is at risk, essentially, for second waves, up flares, whatever. That That's my my take on it anyway. Um, on that point, the bit where Anthony Fauci on the BBC last night was talking about how there could be 100,000 cases a day in the US and he's kind of gearing people up for that. We need to bear in mind that Trump is running for a re-election. He said that he's not going to close down the economy again uh, with that, whatever happens. 
Um, and also we've got to kind of see that some people in the States uh, in that BBC article that was out last night, they had a great thing in New York. I say great. I mean, it's not great. They're, they're people that are basically saying, oh, I'm not um, going to wear a mask. It's against my human right. Um, I can't breathe. Uh, it gives me, you know, whatever. And it, they're just then there was a thing on Twitter today where somebody in a shop was told to wear a mask in America and she promptly started throwing the contents of her car out into the shop around her, right? Thank goodness we are not in that situation, right? Thank goodness. So 39 people watching, if you can tag your friends, join them in the conversation, say hello, get them to comment, uh, I would really, really appreciate it. So that would be really good. Um, so I've mentioned that it's a balancing act, but I think also there's a significant degree of personal responsibility now, right? We're, we're definitely going to be moving towards a point where people are having to make their own decisions about risk. Now, my, my concern about this is to what, in, what extent is it an informed decision about risk and about analysing risk and understanding? And I would hypothesise, and I'd put it out there to see what you guys say, but I would hypothesise that that information isn't really... Thanks for that, Vanessa, I appreciate that. Um, I would hypothesise that that information probably isn't out there for people to make informed consent and informed decisions about the risks that they're going to be taking. Um, so, you know, we can start a conversation. Trisha saying wearing a mask 13 hours a day is hard, but it keeps other people safe. I completely agree. Uh, it is hard. We can still limit stuff in terms of if we limit our trips out then obviously if you're in your house and you're not wearing a mask, that's great if you can be in your house. And so I still think Liz, we shouldn't lose sight of the anti-maskers. How do they think surgeons cope for four hours? What made media? I wonder who wrote that? Anti-maskers, I like that. Um, I wonder who on the team said that. That's a great phrase. Um, it's kind of thrown me because I wasn't expecting that, so that's good. Anti-maskers. Let's, let's see if we can get that going, calling them anti-maskers, right? Um, it's a good point, whoever's made it though, in terms of how do they think surgeons cope for four hours. Uh, you know, that's a case where you can be scrubbed. Having done surgical training a couple of years myself, I can tell you that it's not unusual for surgeons to be scrubbed for 12 hours at a time. They're still alive. They're still breathing. They're still getting oxygen. Uh, so, so all this nonsense about, um, you know, in, in America, people saying it's my human right to breathe and it's it's God's breathing system that you're interfering with. It's just, thankfully, we are not there. OK, that's all I can say about that. Uh, Ingrid, so agreed we cannot get local info. Yes, uh, I completely agree. One of the papers, one of the stories that I'm going to talk about is about how there's this complete disparity. There's this complete mismatch between basically local government and national government in Leicester situation are basically having an argument with each other about whose fault it is. Um, and also they still haven't had any plans uh, sent to them, which they said they would, which sounds like a bit of a disaster. Uh, the interesting thing, I, I, I'm ashamed to say I bought the star uh, only because they put this weird thing on the front of it. I'm not quite sure what it's meant to signify. Um, it's I think it's Dominic Cummings. It's hard to recognise him. Uh, I was going to say when he's not at Barnard Castle, but I won't. Uh, it's hard to recognise him when he's in a in a mask. For some reason, they put Leicester City Football Club on the front of the mask. And then they said officially approved by the government, government, see page five. And then live in lockdown, Leicester and run out of bog roll. Why stick to the rules like decent folk? Simply wear out tried and tested face mask and get out for a drive. We hear there's plenty of toilet paper at Barna Castle. Right, so that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, right? But the thing that I would be really interested to hear from anybody that's in Leicester watching this is what extent, to what level has the local communications been with you? Has it been good? Has it been bad? Has it been non-existent? Okay, because we can get to the bottom of it, right? We, we, we live in, in a uh, democracy where we treasure free speech and we can share information with each other. We've got the tools, we've got the resources. So it'd be really good to hear what people on the ground in Leicester are saying. I've got lots of friends in Leicester, um, obviously from having gone to medical school there, so I'd be really keen to hear. Right, and then going forward in this, so it says go to page five. So I'm gonna to go, to, go to page five. It's something about, oh, for Fox's sake. Uh, not really gonna talk much about that one. A uh, really important story um, is Jackie Beltrow, who I've seen uh, in this one where unfortunately her breast cancer has returned so obviously we wish her the best of luck 
um, and with her treatment. Also, she's doing something incredibly brave and incredibly powerful and useful in terms of sharing her chemotherapy story on social media for other patients to uh, see and take solace from and learn and understand. And so that if they were unfortunate enough to be in, in the position that she's in, then at least they're slightly better prepared for it, right? So that's that piece. Um, I think this this advertising, finally, we're getting messaging from NHS England and the government, which is, well, constructive, helpful, useful. Uh, you know, look at this, right? So I wear this to protect you. Please wear yours to protect me. Wear a face covering to keep your nose and mouth covered at all times on public transport, unless you have a good reason not to, right? I don't think they've gone far enough with this. I think, yes, public transport is important, but why not shops? Why not, um, you know, if you go into a shopping centre and you're, you're wandering around the supermarket, why not shops? Um, I, I get why maybe they're not doing it. They want to nudge people into it. They want to do it slowly. Um, they want to do it. That's a great point, Graham. Uh, I completely agree. Some patients that, uh, you know, people are saying, oh, you know, I can't breathe. Yeah, you're going to get more problems with COVID. Equally, people with pre-existing medical conditions um, probably shouldn't be going out if they've got such medical conditions that they can't wear a mask without um, problems because it's putting them at massive risk, right? So, um, glad to see that the face coverings is finally being promoted in the national press and the media with quite powerful images. I wear this to protect you. Please wear yours to protect me. That's great. Mandated on public transport, obviously. Uh, but there's nothing to stop you guys when you go into your shop for your essential shopping to wear a mask, right? I do. I would. To be fair, I wore it all the way to the shop and all the way home today because there was more people out and about. And the, the other thing that the press are doing, which I think is quite irresponsible, to be perfectly honest, is building this up to be Super Saturday or Independence Day, right? This is far from over. For the 37 people watching, if you all tell five other people, I can't do 37 times five, but then it's a little bit more people, right? And it's, it's spreading the message, it's spreading the word. Watmode Media has 23 odd thousand people. And I thought about that. That's basically the capacity of Watford Football Club. If everybody tells their family members and then they go on and tell other people, although we might not rack up massive views, we get good views, don't get me wrong, but not kind of, I don't know, Peter Stefanovic levels, right? Although we don't rack up massive, massive, massive views because this isn't my full-time job. This is just a passion project, a hobby to help people out with knowledge and information that I've got that I think it's critical to share. But then it's a case of you guys sharing it with your friends and family, spreading the word about what med media. There's free resources, there's useful educational stuff, and it will it will save people's lives, right? Because back in the early days of this, I was telling people to buy pulse oximeters if they could. And uh, initially it was just friends and family before I uh, re-brought up, uh, kind of resurrected and de-mothballed what made media, right? But it's so nice to hear uh, messages from friends and family saying, oh, you know, you told us this four, five, six, seven weeks ago. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it came out with Michael Rosen in terms of he had a pulse oximeter. There was something on the 22nd of April on BBC Radio 4 where they had an emergency medicine physician from the States uh, talking about how we need to see a pulse oximeter as the new way of managing this disease, right? So I will put that plea out to you guys. I don't have any shares in pulse oximeter companies, uh, so I have nothing to gain from it, apart from the fact that I want to... Oh, thanks, Graham. I'd love to go on Channel 4 News. Uh, I've never been invited, but I'd be happy to go if the invitation came. Um, from, from a pulse oximeter point of view, I've got one in the car. I'll go and get it. I'll show you again what it is. Not now, obviously, but I'll do it next time I do this and we'll sit here and we'll talk through it. But the reason that I'd implore you guys all to go on um, Amazon or wherever and get a pulse oximeter is because it's safe, it's non-invasive, it's useful information and part of the natural history of uh, COVID-19 in terms of how the disease process affects people is they can have this period of relatively happy hypoxia or silent hypoxia. Hypoxia means low oxygen levels in the blood. Normally, this is the weird thing about this disease, normally if you had low oxygen in the blood you would be quite short of breath, you'd feel unwell. For some reason, and we don't really know the reasons why yet, for some reason with COVID-19 if you are, you are, you can be quite significantly and severely hypoxic um, and bearing in mind that hypoxia, low oxygen levels, is a reversible cause of cardiac arrest. So for the doctors that are watching will know that it's one of the four H's or the four T's and doctors, nurses, everybody that's watching that's done advanced life support, right? So 
in pre-COVID world, in, in medicine, what we kept on telling people was we need to make sure that your oxygen levels, your saturations are above 100%. Or, or, or if you've got COPD, say 88 to 92%, right? We'll be happy in that range. Now, that has all changed significantly with COVID-19 because the sheer amount of people that um, would potentially have inundated the NHS had it got completely out of control would have been absolutely disastrous. We would have had scenes like we had in Iran, uh, Italy, where you have 800, 900, 1,000 people ventilated in a hospital. And my point to this is, you know, you do not want to get on a ventilator. So the most thing of all of this, most important thing I can tell you guys is make changes to your lifestyle as, as far as you can to minimise and mitigate your risk. And I'm happy to share ways that I do it. You can put questions in the comments. I'll try and get back to them. Uh, brilliant. Well done, Vanessa. That's great. Um, and I'll come back to and tell you why it's important as well. Um, but but it's a case, it's a, a case of mitigating risk, right? And yeah, greater than 94 is what we are being told. Uh, yes, 92, 94, that's a level that we're accepting, right? But the point is, in some people with COVID-19, what happens is they can be so well, apparently, but their pulse oximeter, their SATs are like 70%, right? <laughs> and if you phone up an ambulance and you say, I've got saturations of 70%, I can promise you the ambulance is going to come. Because, it, as I said, hypoxia is a reversible cause of cardiac arrest. So if your heart was to stop beating as a result of lack of oxygen, one of the ways, as it's a reversible cause, we could try and reverse it, is we'd want to correct that reversible cause by giving you high flow oxygen, right? So that is the reason why it's really, really important. Pulse oximeter. Uh, so it's a P-U-L-S-E-O-X-I-M-E-T-E-R. You put it on your finger... And it's got a little LED, LED display on it. You shouldn't be paying more than sort of like 25, 30, 40 quid for it. You can go up to sort of 60 odd. Um, but what that does is that gives you a, a way of measuring the disease, almost like you would use a thermometer to measure fever and temperature, right? Uh, the other thing that's worth noticing and thinking about is in terms of actually uh, a fever is, can be quite helpful in terms of when you're fighting off a viral disease. So all the uh, stockpiling of paracetamol back in the early days of this is completely, first, it's quite selfish, but secondly, it doesn't really help, actually, because you're either only going to um, overdose yourself with uh, paracetamol or you're going to take something that's going to kind of prevent one of your body's natural mechanisms of trying to fight any disease or virus or infection, right? So, so pulse oximeter is a really, really important thing. Um, guys, put the links on there as well, right? Put the links in there. Um, tell me what the reviews are like. Send some photos in as well in terms of like you using them, um, making sure that it's working. The, the really important thing that I need to let you know that you need to be careful about and don't worry and don't panic if the saturations are low are if your fingers are cold, then it can affect the reading. And also if you have nail varnish and stuff, it can affect the reading. Um, but apart from that, generally, if you're warm and well perfused normally, you can pop it on your finger and it'll tell you what your, your oxygen sats are, right? But even then, the, the biggest thing that you can do is mitigate the risk and avoid getting COVID-19. Avoid contracting it. What? How do you do that? What do you do? It's essential travel. You minimise uh, trips out. You minimise your risk that way. Um, yes, there's a big push to open up the economy. Yes, we need to support local business as much as possible. Amazon, Jeff Bezos is on his way to becoming apparently the world's first trillionaire as a result of people around the world uh, buying Amazon stuff to the point that it's, you know, like it's going out of fashion. Myself included, guilty, but it's, it needs must at that point, right? But I think also it's now it's a case of being uh, understanding, respectful, responsible, going out into our local community, supporting local business, because as I said, right at the top of this uh, programme, that we're going to be, people are going to be hitting hard times, right? So we really need to support local business. Obviously, from a pulse oximeter point of view, you can't buy it anywhere else, right? So get it on Amazon. Obviously, some people can't go out, so don't. But if you can go out and you can go out safely, you know, do it and, and check in on your neighbours, you know, if a few of you kind of club together and the, the fittest person goes out um, and then comes back with the shopping for the people in the, the street or the community or the little kind of whatever cul-de-sac, that can help. That's minimising people's risk, right? So that's that. Um, so we talked about that. 
Uh, local lockdown. What is it? Are you in Leicester? Are you watching this? What's it like? Uh, lack of comms. I've asked about. I'd really like to know. Now, uh, last night I saw uh, an Evening Standard story. And I think it's in one of the papers as well, somewhere here that we'll come to. But they said something about people are... Essentially, they were trying to take the piss out of the furlough scheme. They were claiming it. They were still working in the manufacturing and textiles industry. People were being tested positive and they were being told to work and make sure that um, they carried on working even though they were positive. Completely irresponsible. And I think these business owners that are doing this should feel the full force of the law and should be prosecuted because they've endangered you know, essentially a significant number of people and their health and well-being. Um, remind me, if I don't do it, I want to talk to you about long COVID. That's something that I only recently found out about. It's not in the paper, but there's a Sky story that I'm just going to open up. Uh, hold on, let me look at that. Too far away, there we go. Uh, so what I'm going to do, and you guys can do it as well, and while I'm going through the papers, right, if you Google Sky News long COVID, what you'll get is you'll get an article in terms of the first one six days ago, long co long term COVID warning, ICU doctor reports having coronavirus symptoms for three months. That's the image. That's the headline. You can't really see it. Sorry about that because of the lighting. Um, but I really, really need you guys to look at that. Google it. Long, long term COVID Sky News. It's the first hit on Google. Have a read of it. I'll come to that after these these papers. Right. 43 people watching. If you can share, if you can like, if you can comment, if you can make this as interactive as possible, put as many comments as you can. There's no such thing as a silly question. Um, if I can help, I will. Um, and the reason that I prefer to do it this way is because other people watching will get the benefit of the discussion that we have. OK, so front page of the Daily Mail, police to probe UK's worst baby ward scandal. Um, sounds obviously a horrific story. Um, and I mean... <laughs> These kind of things, I don't really like going into a lot because the media only portray one side of it. Um, so obviously it's just, just letting you know. Uh, oh, this is a link. Hold on, who's this? Alison. Alison Cox. Hi, Kisha. My friend has it. They said it was mine. She was still suffering. Uh, Alison, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, I think we need to push for more research. I think we need to push to make sure that we can rule out other causes. Uh, you know, it's not just tipped, uh, or sorry, just attributed to like, anxiety, there's nothing wrong with you, I'll oh, go away, you know, you're fine. We, we really need to make sure that the proper reason, proper things are <laughs> Daily Mail equals rubbish. Uh, yeah, I know, I agree with that, and apologies for buying it. Um, to be honest, I think the thing was, it was a headline that wasn't COVID and it was health related and it kind of caught my eye. Uh, death rates are now below average, but does rise mean it does rise in those dying at home mean they missed urgent care. Um, this is a very real problem, right? We are in danger. Uh, my brother writes medical stories for the mail. <laughs> Your brother, OK. Uh, I won't read the last bit, but thanks for that. Uh, a lot of mainstream papers are all the same. Yeah, Trisha, I agree. They completely are. Um, they are the same, uh, but they have a powerful sway over the population and over their perception of health. So obviously, uh, you know, by doing the paper reviews occasionally a few years ago on Sky, I guess I kind of had the training to do it. I quite enjoy it. I'd much rather doing it from the comfort of my own home with you guys rather than having to get up at three o'clock in the morning and trek over, traipse over to, uh, I can't even remember where it is now, wherever, you know, it's an hour away um, and three o'clock in the morning and, you know, get two minutes to talk a story. At least we can ex we can go through stuff in slightly more depth here, right? So um, does rise in those dying at home, but does rise in those dying at home mean that they missed urgent care, right? So we are in very much danger of medicine returning to the dark ages. We, we, we've we seen from the fact that, uh, I don't know where my water is, but we've seen from the fact that, um, you know, 50% of people are having their heart attacks, their myocardial infarctions, which before COVID, let's remember the, the for an ST elevation MI, uh, so STEMI, non-STEMI wasn't as good, but for an ST elevation MI, uh, STEMI, uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction or heart attack, the um, re revascularization, the stenting, the interventional procedure in the UK was brilliant. It was really, really good. Now we've got to a point where 50% of people are having heart attacks at home, dying at home and not even coming into hospital, right? That is an absolute travesty. And that is something that we need to fight and protect and make sure that these services get up and running in a COVID secure way 
so that people aren't losing their lives ahead of their time for causes that are completely fixable, right? So that's that's the first thing. They've also talked about um, the drug that was a COVID drug, drug grab by the US. Um, and I can't even say it. Medical school was an absolute disaster for me in that regard because being an undiagnosed dyslexic at the time, all these new words were quite difficult to come through. Uh, I think it's Redemesivir, but I don't know. Don't quote me on it. Nightingale Hospital is set to become tan- cancer test centres. That's another area of health uh, which has absolutely been appalling in terms of the two-week wait has just dropped off a cliff for cancer. So too has um, diabetes management potentially in terms of the um, escalation of therapy and making sure people are on the best treatments. So the danger is that we are storing up a pent-up tidal wave of increased mortality i.e death and morbidity i.e suffering in the future so that's something we need to be really mindful of um and then there's lots of uh, photos of boris in a hard hat um which i'm not really going to talk about because it's not really health related um leicester lockdown backlash confusion on whitehall's drip feeding as city pleads for bailout So they're talking, there's a few papers that are verifying this, saying that there's this spat between local government and national government. Um, And uh, here we go, look, so Super Saturday, it could be carnage. It's only going to be carnage if people aren't responsible and they don't, you know, they don't, um, well, if they lose their heads and they go out and they they hit pubs, well, they can't hit clubs, but you know what I mean? If they they rush out, then it's going to be carnage. This is from a Super Saturday point of view. Um, NHS warns of hospital A&E as busy as New Year's Eve. So we need to be really careful about that um, and be calm, be sensible. You know, basically don't go out, I would suggest. I don't think you have to go out and get hammered. I mean, sadly, lots of people are actually getting kind of in that state at home, right? So alcohol sales went up massively. Um, But anyway, so there's that. Uh, There is a great cartoon that I will be kind of posting. I love that. Uh, there's a, a cartoon outside uh, Downing Street, Boz the Builder, Build, Build, Build. And he's opening that up. I thought that was quite funny, quite topical. Uh, there's some stuff in the eye, which I want to talk about. And then what we're going to do is we're going to kind of wrap it to a close. Let me know how long I've been going. They don't tell me the time anymore on this, which is a real shame. They used to. Um, so if you can tell me how long somebody in the comments, how long we've been live for, that'd be really helpful. Um, oh, there was one... Oh, I think it was in this, actually. It was in the mail, again, sorry. And it was, I uh, hate to go back to it, but I will. And it was basically Sarah Vine. I don't need to know exactly what it is, but she was basically saying, normally I'd completely agree with doctors talking about Super Sunday and Carnage or Super Saturday or whatever. Okay, Richard, cheers, I'll better go. Uh, but so Sarah Vine saying, actually, you know, we need to return to normality and I think we all should go to the pubs. I mean, what on earth is she talking about? I hope it's Sarah Vine. I don't want to um, kind of, slander her or something thanks guys that's really helpful um so you know it's it's just we just need to be sensible don't be really and i mean let's just wait and see let's see what's happening in the rest of the world and i think if we've got global leaders and health experts saying that you know the um head of the director general of the world health organization saying we're not out of the woods it's going to get more dangerous yet fauci dr anthony fauci in the u.s saying we're going to see brace ourselves for 100,000 cases a day um <laughs> Yeah, I just, I, I'm not going to go out, let me assure you. Um, so I like May having an a, attacking Johnson's choice of new national security advisor. Kind of medical, health security. I think that's fair game to talk about. Um, she, she's basically saying, why was he appointed? Who's this person? Um, I think it's interesting to see that there's some of the, I can't remember the phrase that they said, but sort of Tory uh, grandees, did they say? Um, Ingrid, husband not being able to get his review, RE diabetes. I'm sorry to hear that. Maybe uh, get them to do it on phone if possible. Try and do this. Oh, that's bad, isn't it? Look at that. Uh, I should probably not have done that. I forgot, forget how long the hair's got. Um, and then, okay, this is interesting. Sarah Neville in the eye. How, the, how does the NHS need to change after COVID? Uh, and they're saying, one, care at a distance. Yeah, maybe. Uh, as long as it's not a case of marginalising and isolating people that don't have access to computers or whatever or don't want to and i think as long as we have both that's good uh vanessa british people are being lulled into a false sense of security by the deliberately vague vague messages from on high um 
Yeah, I mean, I think the danger is then we can turn around, or sorry, we can be turned around too and told, look, you know what, it's your fault. You broke the lockdown, you did this. Yeah, I'm a bit worried, Alison, about Prof Van Tam. He's gone, uh, not MIA, but missing, basically. I think we should, you know, they've scrapped all the press conferences, haven't they, in terms of they, they don't kind of want the scrutiny, maybe? Is it fair to say that? Or the accountability? I don't know. Um, I think they're useful. I think maybe you could have at least put them to weekly or kind of bi-weekly or something. Um, but yeah, they, they've been scrapped. It's going to go up. No way will I be going out. Even Australia having a rise in infections. Fair enough, Emma. Fair enough. Um, but I, I, I just think the caveat to this, right, is make sure that you're not letting your mental health suffer. Uh, you know, I still go out for my once daily exercise as much as possible. Um, racked up a good amount of cycling, 1,500 miles. I think it's 106,000 calories since I started my biohacking adventure. So for those of you that are new and watching, right at the beginning of this, I th said that, you know, I was overweight by a little bit. Uh, I was half Asian. I have an autoimmune history. Uh, there's enough risk factors there for me to think, right, I need to get fit. So it's a case of controlling everything that I can to mit mitigate the risk of getting it. And I think uh, I'm not going to go through the times because I can't really... Uh, remember if there are that many stories and I did most of them but I want to save the time for long Covid which is really really important so if you share with your friends now and you say this is the only part of the video that they watch at half an hour in then it's most important because I'm literally just going to read this uh, article to you and then we'll call it a day so long-term Covid warning ICU doctor reports having coronavirus symptoms for three months Dr Jake Suet uh, I don't know if I've said that right I hope I have uh, first developed symptoms on 20th of March despite having no underlying health conditions and is still unwell. And this is by Laura Kay, or Key, news reporter. Um, yeah, that's a really good point, Jane. It does indicate to people that it's all over and it's far from it, right? So that just means that um, we essentially need to be the resistance in that regard, right? Uh, we need to share knowledge. We need to do these kind of uh, sessions. We need to talk about what's happening in the press. We need to appraise it critically. Um, we need to have an open and frank discussion. If I have knowledge like I can share, like the pulse oximeters, then I will. If you have questions, then you ask them. If other people can help, that's great. If not, I will try my best and get to them. Um, but but this is even more important than ever. And the other thing, I'm not going to say I'm going to do it every day. I'm not going to say I'm doing it at a set time, but I'll do it and then we'll leave it for a period and then you can kind of share it with friends and check in on it and things, all right? So after this one, I'm going to be having a look at the comments from the one where I was wandering around with an umbrella. But anyway, an intensive care doctor is warning people of the frightening effects of long-term COVID ahead of lockdown lifting, as he is still suffering from symptoms three months on. Uh, Dr. Jake was helping Britain tackle coronavirus only for only a week before he developed symptoms on the 20th of March. The ICU doctor who works for the NHS in Norfolk had no underlying health conditions and went to the gym four or five times a week, right? So he's fit, healthy, well, and he's 31 years old. But what first happened appeared to be tiredness and a sore throat soon turned into a fever, dry cough and shortness of breath. 12 weeks on, he's still suffering from chest pain, breathlessness, blurred vision, memory loss, high temperature, concentration problems and is unable to work. He told Sky News, quote, I still get out of breath doing the washing up or wash, walking around the house. I spent three days just gasping for breath in bed. I really thought I was going to die. It was very distressing. Things have improved since then, but not much and only very, very slowly. I've had gastrointestinal spinal symptoms and shooting pains in my hands and feet too. Public health figures, public health England figures, and I didn't buy the Telegraph, but I saw the Telegraph. There was a thing and I could, I think I've uh, subscribed to it, so I'll see if I can get that article because I didn't get the physical paper. But public health uh, England have been slammed by Boris Johnson saying it was their fault for a lack of response and he's going to rip them up and kind of shred them and do stuff, whatever. I'm I'm putting words in the PM's mouth there. I don't mean it, but um, it's basically the, the, the gist of that article was uh, public health England could be scrapped, redesigned, whatever. Um, because their response to it was sorely lacking. Um, I'm only saying that because it mentioned public health, so it made that weird tangential link, so sorry about that. But anyway, public health England figures showed that 19 out of 20 COVID-19 patients recover without needing hospital treatment. That's uh, great. 39 people watching. If you can share it, if you can ask your questions, I'd really, really appreciate it. 
Um, Dr. Sewer is part of a Facebook group with at least 5,000 people from across the country who are suffering from what they refer to as long COVID with symptoms lasting as long as 14 weeks. With no government data available on recovery rates, Dr. Sir wants scientists to investigate why thousands are being hit so badly by the virus and whether there's a separate post-COVID syndrome. Uh, we don't know, and there could be, and again, it just adds more evidence to the way that I'm quite happy, hold up, uh, doing essential travel if I have to, you know, cycling to see my grandma, dropping off stuff to wherever I have to, if I really have to go out in the car. Um, but certainly not just going out for the sake of it, exercising. And when I do go out to the shops, it's for a specific purpose in mind. It's a planned trip. I've got glove. I've got something to tie my hair back. I've got glasses because there has been roots of ocular transmission as well, apparently. I put my phone away. I'm aware of my surroundings around me. If I have to walk like an ant kind of route, like crisscrossing all the way over a road or whatever, as long as I'm careful with the traffic, then that's the safest way of doing it. And then I come back. Uh, unfortunately, there's no um, browsing for pleasure. I never really liked doing that, but I did a little bit. It's certainly not something I'd recommend now. Um, but to be fair, right, shops are saying, look, please limit browsing. Superdrug in Watford, please limit your browsing. Please don't touch things. I think we can all as well. This is more official, it's not really official advice, but it's more, well, it's what med media official advice, right, that has come out before any other proper advice, official advice, and it's it's right, is when we're out and we're looking at stuff, let's try not to touch it, okay? We can look at stuff without touching it. So if it's on the shelves, don't pick it up, look at it, put it near your face and put it away. I saw a guy in Lidl the other day, who had a mask round his chin like a hammock. Don't know what on earth that was about. But then he was opening up air for fresheners, touching them with ungloved hands, putting them near his face, breathing on them, <laughs> sniffing them. And then I think, oh, he's going to put it in his trolley. And he puts the bloody thing back on the on the thing. And I was just like, oh, my God. So if you do go out to the shops, you put your hands in your pockets. Don't touch stuff, right? Because inadvertently, you could kill somebody. And... <laughs> The, the difficulty with this is there's a lot of people a few days ago, I didn't, I wanted to do a press review, review, but I didn't get around to it. But Boris was saying stuff like, do not think that you are invincible. Young people do not, they're not invincible. And he's right, but he didn't go far enough in terms of talking about this long COVID, right? Because the messaging is an absolute shambles. And, and what we need to do is we need people to be aware that yes, it's a risk, but it can be mitigated. It can be managed. It is safe to go out. It's a, a collective effort. We all need to not touch stuff. We all need to wear masks if we can. We all need to wear alcohol, oh, sorry, wear gloves, use alcohol gel and wash our hands. And it is possible to go out, get what you need, support the local economy, live a nice life, come back and survive, right? So that's what we need to do. Sorry, I'll get back to uh, this story. Um, whether there's a post-COVID syndrome, Lucy Bailey, UK, a Twitter account, one in 20 people still aren't recovered from COVID after one month. I'm still on well after eight weeks. I was healthy, no underlying conditions. Please be careful as lockdown eases. Uh, this could happen to you too. Long COVID, long tail COVID, COVID one in 20, COVID one in 10, COVID 19, pubs reopening. And then there's a picture here, which hopefully will show up, which is age 32, day 56. Uh, day 56, see if I can read backwards, here we go. So day 56, chest pain, fatigue, pins and needles. I uh, can't read that. Smooth joint and muscle pain, headaches, age 23, and more symptoms she's got, chills and sweats, shortness of breath, numbness, exercise something, and brain fog, okay? So, so this brain fog and this malaise and this lethargy and also coupled with the neurological symptoms in terms of the hands, is really quite significant because what that illustrates and what that demonstrates is this pathogen, this virus, is actually affecting the central nervous system. So it's it's crossing potentially the blood-brain barrier and it's having neurological effects on our body, right? So it's a nasty, nasty virus. And the, the uh, anecdotal evidence that's coming out now, there's not a randomised controlled trial about it, it's too early. There's not clinical studies about it, it's too early. But just like back in March, when I was warning you guys that this is a bit iffy, we need to be careful, we need to be mindful, we need to see what this is. Just like then, I proved out to be right, unfortunately. I have a, a have a feeling that I think I'm going to be proved right on this as well. And I hope I'm proved wrong, right? Because if I'm proved wrong, it means that there is no long-term chronic virus infection 
and it's all something and nothing. But just like back in the early days, from the case histories that I took from people, we found out that lack of smell, a loss of smell and loss of taste were very early symptoms. It became apparent that there was a neurological element to that. And that only very kind of late in the day got added to the official list of symptoms. So let's just be mindful of this. Let's arm ourselves with the knowledge. Let's appraise ourselves with the information so we can all start making informed decisions about risk and what we're willing to do and what we're not willing to do. Fine. So 31 also claims that tests were so sparsely available at the peak of the pandemic, many who appear to have caught it at the beginning have no proof, but are still experiencing the debilitating symptoms. He said there are thousands of people who have just been left to suffer frightening symptoms for months. I got tested after four weeks, but because I work well, because I work for the NHS, it came back negative. But I've still never been so short of breath in my life. I, ke I kept thinking this is not normal. This is not OK. Somebody needs to be following this. With pubs, restaurants, hairdressers reopening on the 4th of July, he added, I can understand why people are excited about lockdown easing, but I wish more people knew about us. We can't just bury our heads in the sand. We have a group of people saying that this is happening and we don't want to increase the size of that group if we can help it. Uh, Prof Devi Shridhar, who's the chair of Global Public Health at, uh, I want to say Edinburgh, I think it is. Just bear in mind that she was on Channel 4 News uh, and she said on Channel 4 News that this could be the uh, polio scandal of our time. For those of you that don't know, in the 40s, um, we ended up, we say we, royal we, ended up giving polio to people as an accident because the vaccine was uh, ended up being live rather than attenuated. So we were vaccinating people against polio, which is obviously a horrible disease and vaccination for that is a good thing. Um, but something went wrong and uh, basically that uh, something went wrong and we gave people polio inadvertently. Right. Uh, thanks, Alison. That's really kind. Uh, that's that's really, really kind. So please share it. Spread it as far as you can. You know, I've got a full time job. Um, I'm not getting paid for this. Uh, I'm I'm switching off from it as well. But I am popping up with these broadcasts because I'm getting feedback that they're helpful for people. So. So, yeah, if you could share it, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, anyway, uh, Professor of Immunology at Imperial College London, Danny Altman, echoed Dr. Seward's calls for scientific study into the potential long term effects of the disease. He told Sky News there are people out there who are worried and want to know more about this. It needs to be firmly on the medical agenda because we're going to have COVID follow up clinics for years to come. I completely agree. And also the medical agenda as a profession, we need to say when we don't know. We need to say when there's a, a knowledge deficit or a, a learning you know, we're learning more about a disease so that the body of knowledge isn't there. And what we really, really can't do as healthcare professionals is uh, rubbish people's symptoms and say it's anxiety. There's nothing wrong with you. Go away because we're still learning about the disease. So we don't know. So we really need that kind of um, that really analytical approach, uh, clinical reasoning, diagnostic reasoning to try and put together the building blocks of, oh, that's a bit odd. You know, what were you like before this and why are you different now? Uh, talking about huge impact on NHS manpower as well as people's lives. Uh, asking about how it should affect the lockdown easing, he added, we have thousands of people reminding us that this might not just haunt us for this summer, but it might haunt people for the rest of their lives. We, we honestly don't know, right? We honestly don't know. Lucy Bailey, 32, is in her ninth week, ninth week of feeling unwell. Uh, she says she is still unable to do more than two hours of work from home after her first symptoms came on 27th of April. She said there's zero mention of this from the government. People think that if you don't die from it, you'll bounce back in two weeks. Um, I think there's enough evidence out there to suggest that most people do bounce back in two weeks. However, there is obviously, as this evidence by this, there is a significant cohort of people who are not bouncing back. And we need to research what makes them um, vulnerable to not bouncing back. What are the reasons for it? Why, why is that the case, right? Um, so Dr. Sitz writing to people, urging to people to write to their MPs, raise awareness uh, of patients like him among employers, ministers and healthcare bosses, which I think is really important. Uh, he added, if one in 10 people with the virus are incapacitated and they can't work, that's not good for anyone. I'd be inclined to completely agree. Um, an NHS spokesperson said a detail, sorry, dedicated rehab service has been set up for COVID patients. He, they added, while our country emerges from the peak of coronavirus, the next phase of the response will mean expanding and, com and strengthening community health and care services in new ways, as well as setting up extra psychological care for staff. A Department for Health and Social Care spokesman told Sky News that anyone who requires a test can now go and get one and antibody testing is available on N for NHS workers who think they may have had the virus early on. OK, so, uh, oh, cool. Save our NHS event, COVID Zoom tomorrow with Prof Alison Pollock. Yeah, that's great. 
I, I actually reached out to the Independent Sage uh, on Twitter uh, asking if they wanted to use the WhatMed Media platform for their uh, things. They didn't get back to me, sadly. So very sad. If anybody on uh, Independent Sage happens to be watching this, or if anybody watching knows anybody on Independent Sage, that offer is there. Uh, I think they're doing great work. Um, I've watched some of their broadcasts. I think they're fascinating. I think they're riveting, as uh, to, to coin a phrase that's been used already. And I'd really like to help them. I'd really like to share kind of this page with them so that they can make use of the, the platform that it provides. So, you know, if they wanted to live stream it on WhatMed Media as well, to the WhatMed Media audience, the offer is there. Um, so, so please do get in touch. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for spending almost, I think it's 50 minutes now, so it's quite a long one this evening uh, off your off your evening with me, and thank you for your time. Um, I hope you are well. I hope you found this useful and helpful. Uh, please keep on putting stuff in the comments after the video. I will s send, like, you know, 100 quid worth of ads uh, for it just so we can spread it to, to, to more people. And uh, I will add the link in the description for the GoFundMe page. Uh, so that if you want to contribute uh, to this, um, it's uh, basically the money that goes to GoFundMe is used 100% for adverts, for Facebook ads, to reach, to get this to reach more people. On its own, it will reach between five to 10,000 people. Not really enough, quite a competitive person. 100% um, of the money that goes to that, GoFundMe will take their little slice. Um, and uh, apart from that, everything that is left with me uh, is a completely separate bank account. 100% of the funds that come to me will go on Facebook ads. I have all the equipment from the media stuff that I've done in the past. I'm studying this anyway and I'm buying the papers because I'm writing an MD about how media can be used in communication during a global media pan a global mass pandemic. Um, and I've got all the data plans. So the only thing is my time and there's no way I'm going to charge for my time for something as important as this. So it's over to you guys. If you guys can contribute to the GoFundMe, uh, even if it's a pound, even if it's one pound, I would be so, so grateful because, you know, 32 people give a quid. That's 32 quid. That helps us ticking along. We've raised £1,100 so far. I've stretched it to 15. Shane, hello, mate. Uh, I'm going to bring you on camera, see what happens. But do not swear, as Davina McCall on Big Brother would say. Oh, I can't bring Shane on camera. Gutted. Gutted, Shane. Um, I'm going to wave to you instead and I'm going to try again. Let's see if we can bring Shane. I really rate Shane. Uh, he's one of my mates in Leicester. He, no, I can't bring him on camera. Okay. Um, so oh, that's a real shame. But anyway, we've raised a good amount of money. Uh, we haven't spent a lot of it. We've reached hundreds of thousands and millions of people um and we will continue to do so but i need your help so one, once this video gets posted if you can check back in on the what Word page scroll down to it click on the gofundme link and contribute some money to advertising on facebook for this i would be so grateful i will also upload it on youtube so you can spread it to people who are not on facebook so we can get this knowledge out there wider and farer further even i'm getting tired now i need to stop and drink thank you so much for your time thank you very much for watching look after yourselves and each other and i will see you guys really really soon cheers take care see you in a bit